Go ahead. Are you ready to present? Ah, yes, sir. Uh, if both of us can hear each other, then there is no problem. We just can just go ahead and uh, who is pre oh, I think that the name, both your names are written there. You are Balasundram from Railways, is it? Ah, yes, sir. I'm Balasundram from Southern Railways, sir. Okay. Are you, uh, so whatever you have been taught in your surgical training, how to examine the theta, you have to uh, de demonstrate to the examiner in the examination if a live patient is given to you. Please don't forget that. And for uh, seeing whether it moves with the deglutition or not, you are always to ask the patient to sip some water. Instead of ask them to swallow just the saliva, it is always better to ask for a small glass of water and ask them to sip it so that you can see it from both front as well as from the profile. From the side angle also, you have to see whether it is moving with deglutition or not. Right. Now, I will accept your diagnosis and the case scenario, I have given that this patient requires surgery. Okay. So, yes. how are you going to proceed? What is the type of anesthesia you can give? How to proceed with the surgery? Why surgery is indicated in this patient? We have tried medical it's management. Surgery, sir. Surgery, sir. Once the medical treatment gets in, not mm -hmm. so far with the uh, medical treatment, we can go ahead with surgery, sir. Okay. So the failed medical management only warrants surgery. Otherwise, normally we don't try to do surgery for a patient, especially if they have uh, features of hyperthyroidism. That is overactivity of the thyroid. If it is present, our aim is always first to manage it by giving medications and try to bring the patient to what is called the youth thyroid state or normal thyroid state. Okay. So in this situation, the commonest thing, the way exam can proceed is, what are the anti-thyroid medications that are prescribed? It is methimazole, carbimazole, and propyl thiouracil, sir. Okay. And uh, beta blockers uh, can be given, sir, like propranolol. Okay. And uh, uh, we can go with iodide therapy, sir. Uh, it, it can be like radioactive iodide therapy or it can be given in the oh, form of Lugol's iodine. Hmm. Uh, is it Lugol's iodine a regular therapy or it is used only for a special situation? No. Yes, sir. If we are not, so, sorry, we are sir, not able to achieve use state. Hmm. So if, if, the if we are not able to achieve uh, uh, no, uh, no, uh, signal uh, Okay, okay. Hello? Lokesh Kumar is answering the questions. If you are Hello? not getting prop, you you can you can shut down. If you are not getting, you Hello? try to close and then try to rejoin. Can anyone else in the railways uh, intimate Jai Bharti? Are you there? Yes, sir. I'll call him. Yeah, please tell uh, your colleague that uh, he can okay, uh, sir, okay. I'll shut say. down and re-log again. Okay, sir. Sure, sir. Thank you. Okay. So, Lugal is not the uh, drug not for floating day to day therapy. It is only for pre operative treatment to control the vascularity and the reduce the size of the swelling before the surgery okay it is not on a regular yes, basis you give local side uh, yes, so these are the drugs now the other question that you can expect in the examination is what is the mode of action of all these drugs you said propel thioracil you said carbamazole you said uh, steroids i mean uh, yes, propranolol beta blocker and uh, uh, radioactive iodine what is the mode of action and indications for these drugs? Uh, the methimazole acts on the uh, synthesis of uh, iodine, iodine mm. set mm. in the organification step uh, mm. and oxidation step, and in that place it acts. Okay. The carbimazole gets converted to methimazole, mm. basically, mm. Uh, and uh, propyl thiouracil. Mm. Um, I'm not able to recollect. Sir. Okay. Mm. 
What about your radioactive iodine? What is the purpose of giving? Is it to control the symptoms or is it uh, does it do something else? It decreases the iodine uptake, sir. Causes ablation of the gland itself. Radioactive, you know, it's a radioactive, it's like a radiation. Okay. So when radioactive iodine is given, it completely destroys the uh, asana cells so that the total production of thyroxine is decreased. Okay. That is how it acts. In fact, if you if a patient is given radioactive iodine, the patient is kept in isolation. Other family members are not supposed to yes, go sir. near yes, them sir. because they will get the emission of the radiation from the patient. So it is more to destroy the gland in patients who are having uh, hyperactivity and not per se to reduce the secretion or synthesis of the uh, thyroxine uh, hormone. So this, uh, after this pharmacology question, they can jump to the physiology question of how the synthesis of thyroid hormones takes place. What is the steps? What are the steps? How it is happening? So that is a very common question which you have to be very thorough with in, answer, in your answers. Can you describe that, Lokesh? Yes, sir. Mm. Uh, first, the uh, thyroid hormone yeah. is released from the hypothalamus sir. Uh, it goes and activates the pituitary and uh, it helps in synthesis of the thyroid stimulating hormone uh, this goes and acts at the uh, level of the thyroid gland and uh, uh, it helps in the uh, uh, iodine uh, uptake and uh, helps in the formation of uh, coupling reaction that is monoiodothyronine and diiodothyronine combined with each other to form uh, T3 and T4 in the mm. follicular cells mm. and uh, it gets uh, by, uh, bound with the thyroid binding globulin uh, mm. and uh, uh, it gets uh, most of the uh, hormone is in this bound state and uh, uh, very few few amount of the hormone is, in, uh, is released in mm. as a free fraction. So. Mm. It is a negative feedback system, sir. System. Mm. Where do you get this iodine from for the formation of this uh, various com compositions of iodine and tyrosine, mono, di, tri, and tetra? Where is the source for the iodine? It is absorbed from the gut, sir. It is absorbed from the gut. Very good. Uh, that also has to be included because iodine yes. does not come straight to the blood. Okay. It is absorbed yes, from the gut and then from the dietary sources. Then it gets converted and then carries in the blood. So is it absorbed in the form of iodine or iodide? It is absorbed in the form of iodide, sir. Hmm. Uh, it gets converted to iodine, sir. Yeah. by thyroid peroxidase enzymes. Enzymes, which is stored with the enterocells, the, the cells in the uh, gut, or if it's immediately transported? Uh, it is stored, sir. Stored. Uh, whenever, does it go straight to the thyroid gland or is it uh, going to the liver also to some extent? Yes, sir. It goes to the liver and then uh, yeah, it reaches, it reaches the thyroid gland. So this that is why we do. So it goes. That is why we do the ALT enzymes sir, uh, preoperatively to check the thyroid levels. Okay. So these are the steps that you have to remember. What is the peculiarity about the amino acid tyrosine to which the iodine binds? That's this have any connection with any other hormone secreted in the body? Uh, yes, sir, catecholamines. Ah. So the formation of catecholamine also requires tyrosine. So our thyroid hormone synthesis also involves the utilization of tyrosine and catecholamine synthesis also utilizes this uh, amino acid tyrosine. So when the base component 
This is a common factor of tyrosine for both tyroxine and catecholamine. What is the peculiarity or what is the importance of that? We, we must not use specific uh, drugs, sir. Uh, uh, whenever we face, uh, we must not use uh, direct what is the main drugs, action sir? of catecholamines. Where do they act? Tax on the heart, sir. It has cardiovascular system. Cardio means, means it acts on the cardiovascular system, not only on the heart, but also on the vasculature. Okay. So when the base component is tyrosine in catecholamines, and the same is there in thyroxine, that is the reason for thyroxine acting on the cardiovascular system in a manner similar to catecholamines when they, they are produced in excess. Okay. So that is the reason one in hyperthyroidism, you get tachycardia, hypertension, all these things happen because of the similarity in the base component of both the thyroxine as well as the catecholamines. Okay, that is the main reason. Now, uh, the next question they can ask you is, this patient, they have put her on some drugs and medications, they have tried even radioactive iodine therapy, and still the patient has all the features. Is it advisable to go ahead and do the surgery for this patient? If so, what are the risks that the patient has? When there is a failed medical management and surgeon advises removal of the gland for control of the hyperactive state of the gland, what is the risk involved in doing the surgery? Thyrotoxic causes crisis, sir. Thyrotoxic crisis. Okay. What is the difference between hyperthyroidism and thyrotoxicosis? Are they both same or different? But it's both different, sir. What is it? How is it different? Sir, uh, hyperthyroidism means on the elevation of uh, the uh, T3 and T4 levels, sir. Very good. Mm. Uh, thyrotoxicosis? It's the features of uh, uh, So the tissue effects by the thyroid, elevated thyroid hormones is called thyrotoxicosis. That is only when the patient has tachycardia, palpitation, nervous uh, anxiety or seizures. If all these things are present, then it has to be called as thyrotoxicosis. That is the tissue effects due to elevated thyroid hormones is thyrotoxicosis. Whereas patient may have an elevated level, but they may not have the classical features of tachycardia, central nervous system involvement, sweating and all those things. They may just have a mild anxiety alone or they may be irritable. That is all what they may uh, get exposed to. Then when you do that uh, assessment of the thyroid gland function, you will find all these values are elevated. Then it has to be called only as hyperthyroidism and not as thyrotoxicosis. So many people use these two terminologies interchangeably. That uh, any mild elevation in the thyroid values, they call the patient as thyrotoxic patient. It should not be so. It should be called only as hyperthyroid patient and patients who are exhibiting all the features of the various system involvement. Then only it should be called as thyrotoxicosis. Now, for example, yes. this patient gets controlled with all the symptoms. The anxiety reduces, the sweating reduces, the palpitation is not there anymore. But the values of T3, T4 are always on the higher side. And that is the reason the surgeon wants to operate and remove the gland because the symptoms may recur at any time. If that is so, is there any risk in operating in this patient? What is, if so, what is that risk and how do you manage that? First, uh, hypothyroidism risk is there, sir. First, the cost of the surgery, sir. First thing is the uh, cost of the surgery. And the second thing is hypoparathyroidism can occur due to the, uh, and uh, now that it's a recurrent laryngeal now, one second, one second, Dr. Balasandram. I think you have not understood my question correctly. My okay. question is, 
patient has been treated for hyperthyroidism with antithyroid drugs including okay, radioactive iodine the symptoms have disappeared but the values are still elevated which means she has not become u thyroid completely okay sir at that stage if the surgeon says he wants to operate and remove the thyroid because the t3 t4 values are not coming down even though symptomatically the patient has improved is there any risk caused by the surgery that is what my question is i am not asking what are all the post op complications okay yes sir, sir patient will de develop intraoperatively uh, thyroid storms will develop or is there a possibility of developing uh, is, it is there is a possibility of developing ah, there is always a risk of developing thyrotoxic crisis or thyroid storm whenever yes, any patient has not become u thyroid by anti thyroid medications or even patients who are well under control and who are continuing anti thyroid medication there is always a possibility of intra or post operative thyroid crisis happening that should be explained to the patient if patient agrees she says yes i would like to go ahead and have the surgery and surgeon is also willing to operate then what are the precautions or preparations you will do to anesthetize this patient sir uh, first i will preoperatively uh, try to give uh, uh, lugol's iodine for 7 days sir preoperatively and i will try to decrease the vascular system to assess the severity of this hyperthyroid it yes sir yes sir what are the there scoring? is two scoring systems sir uh, Burch and Watowski scoring system and Akamizu criteria. There are two criteria, sir. Very good. Uh, what are the factors so, that you take into consideration there? The first one. Remember it exactly, wrong. sir. Yeah. Don't remember. Okay. Uh, sir. Do you know that? Yes, Do you know that two uh, scoring criteria? What are the points that you have to look into, and what is the day? Uh, score which says the uh, hyperthyroidism is mild moderate or severe ah yes sir thermoregulatory dysfunction sir temperature we have to assess sir uh, temperature and the uh, central nervous system whether the patient is uh, agitated or not uh, lethargic or severe uh, seizures ataxia is there or not sir and the uh, gastrointestinal yes, system sir is there yes. any diarrhea vomiting uh, any other feature is there sir gastrointestinal cardiovascular system tachycardia we have to see sir whether whether yeah. heart rate is uh, uh, more than uh, 140 120 to 130 uh, and uh, less than uh, 110 to 120 and less than 110 uh, we have to assess okay. and then absence of uh, uh, congestive heart failure is there uh, mild moderate and severe uh, pedal edema and pulmonary edema is there or atrial fibrillation is there sir cardiovascular system Okay. Um, and any precipitating events like when the stress infection is there or not, sir? We have to uh, look for these uh, diagnostic parameters, sir. Very good. So there are points given for all these things, like uh, 30 points, 25 points, 20 points, 15, then like that, depending upon the various categories. So more than 35, if a patient gets more than 35 after examining all these parameters. then that is considered as a severe degree of hyperthyroidism okay if it is less than 35 between 25 and 35 it is considered as a mild degree of hyperthyroidism less than 25 it is considered as moderate or very i mean moderate and then mild degrees of hyperthyroidism similarly there is another scoring system called akima uh, uh scoring system which also akama is so first uh, akama is used Uh, i think it's a japanese name akamizu uh, scoring system so based on this scoring system you have to first identify what type of uh, how severe the hyperthyroidism is and if it is between mild and moderate definitely it can be uh, not so severe you don't uh, expect a severe thyrotoxic crisis to happen but if it is very severe it is better to wait for some more time try with more medications and then try to take up the patient so that is the first criteria that you have to employ in these cases and once the decision to do the surgery is done 
your first answer is to give the patient lugol sidin for at least one week isn't it minimum one week or 10 days how much how long you want to give 7 to 10 days 7 to 10 days what is lugol sidin what is its composition sir 5% iodine in 10% potassium iodide sir very good how much is given what is the dose sir uh, five to eight drops sir six early we, uh, we can give sir we can give okay after stopping the drug how within what time you have to operate mm. do you have sir. to operate while you have finished the course or you can wait for some time and operate sir, we have, we have, sir, uh, sir we have to give for 17 to 14 days sir once the uh, thyroid uh, parameters are uh, uh, getting normalized we can do sir and symptoms also sir no how long after stopping the drug you have to operate how soon or what is the time between stoppage of the drug and the surgical time can it be done after one month of stopping the drug no sir, no, sir one week sir within one week okay you have to operate within one week and what is this uh, mechanism called by giving exercise in you try to reduce the production of uh, the uh, thyroid secretions wool chaikov effect sir wool chaikov effect okay chaikov that means you switch off the thyroxine production In that way you can remember the name wool chaikov you can switch off the production of thyroxine okay so that is a, another question that can be asked okay you have given uh, lugol thyroxine for uh, one week then what is your next plan for the uh, anesthetizing this patient uh on the day of surgery i will give all the anti thyroid drugs to the patient very good uh, i will i will get uh, informed consent and after checking the identity and site of the uh, i will wheel the patient to the ot and uh, i will uh, uh, do the pre anesthetic check of the boys machine and uh, i i will uh, Uh, keep all the emergency drugs uh, ready uh, uh, and uh, 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 i will prepare myself for uh, intraoperative uh, thyroid uh, crisis if at all it occurs okay. and then uh, so what are the preparations uh, that you want to do for managing a thyroid crisis intraoperatively what uh, things you are going to get ready with? Yes, sir. Uh, the emergency drug is a very common thing for every surgery. In all the OTs, you should have the emergency drug ready. You don't know which patient will develop what complications intraoperatively. So, generalized yes, terminology of uh, emergency drugs include cardiovascular drugs, uh, respiratory drugs like bronchodilators, diuretics. All these things are all drugs which are commonly should be immediately available in any OT. Okay. Yes. Specific to thyroid crisis management, what are the preparations or what are the drugs and other equipments that you require? I would keep a beta blocker like propranolol and esmolol ready, sir. Very good. And uh, uh, I uh, I would uh, like to administer the propyl thioracil methimazole or carbimazole through the nasogastric tube. So I will keep those medications available inside the OT, sir. and uh, uh, i will keep a uh, cool iv fluids ready with me yeah uh, mm. and uh, normally we use uh, cooling warming blankets or uh, cooling blankets in the ot normally we use warm normally blankets warm blankets, blankets to keep the patient uh, normothermic but here what will you keep ready we have to use cold blankets cold, cold blanket. iv fluids sir and uh, temperature body temperature also body temperature initially you cannot uh, keep it uh, high i mean low very low because the patient will uh, i mean surgeon will find it uncomfortable cooling blankets and ice packs we can keep sir uh, ice packs you have to keep ready and cooling blankets also and nasogastric uh, installation of cold saline or yes, Where else you can in, introduce cold saline to reduce the pore temperature? What irrigation you can do? One piece you can do gastric irrigation with cold saline. Where else you can irrigate? 
bladder sir urinary bladder, bladder yeah. sir. you can do bladder irrigation with cold saline okay so this is a very very important step for you to control the hyperthermia that will happen so what will be the earliest indication when you start surgery and then the surgery has started its proceeding what is the earliest indication you will get that the patient may develop thyroid crisis is it tachycardia is it uh, hypertension or is it uh, something else uh, it was, uh, laryngoscopy is no, no, no. See, you have started the case, you have intubated, surgeon position, okay. surgeon has painted okay. and he is about to, he has even started the incision and he is proceeding with the surgery. Now, okay, tachycardia will be there. Tachycardia can be due to any reason, like pain of an okay. yeah, pain, everything can produce. Sir, increased ETCO2 will be there, sir. That due to increase the increase in a normal ETCO2, okay? As soon as you intubate and check the air entry on both sides, it will be normal until the time the patient starts developing the thyroid crisis, ETCO2 will remain normal. But when the ETCO2 for no reason, you have a very, very fresh soda lime, your air entry is normal, your ventilator settings are normal, and all along for the first 15 or 25, 30 minutes, the ETCO2 is normal between 35 and 40. Now, suddenly it starts going up to 45, 50, 60. That is the first and foremost indicator because tachycardia may be because of other reasons. And if you have a temperature monitor, that may also start showing a rise along with the tachycardia. So, more than tachycardia, yes, abrupt sudden rise in ETCO2 with an increase in the Temperature monitor showing a raised temperature. These are the two things. And under the drapes, patient will start sweating also. In spite of the ambient temperature being cold, patient, uh, if you are able to put your hand and feel the heat or the dorsum of the hand, you can feel them all having a layer of sweat present in that situation. Why this happens? Why this sudden increase in ATCO2 happens? Increased BMR, sir. Uh, increased increased metabolic rate. Yes, sir. BMR, it is a metabolic rate. Okay. Okay. So, sir. what is it? What is the definition of BMR or basal metabolic rate? How do you define that? What is the definition? Because thyroid activity is one mainly to control our metabolism, metabolic rate. So. What is yes, the sir. definition of basal metabolic rate? How do you define that? What is the what is the necessity okay. for no. normal metabolism for us? Why do we eat to get energy, isn't it? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ah, so the energy not able to put that in words, metabolism sir. of carbohydrates, proteins, or fat, isn't it? So the energy yes, produced at resting conditions for a normal adult after 12 hours of uh, feeding is called basal metabolic rate. Metabolic. Okay? The energy produced after a good amount of rest. That means you should not be exercising because you are talking about basal metabolic rate. Whereas when you start exercising or doing some hard work or you are mentally stressed, then your metabolic rate will go up. That is not called the basal metabolic rate. So the basal metabolic rate is the energy produced after a good relaxed resting individual for 12 hours of feeding. Because if once you start eating, then also metabolism will go up because food gets uh, absorbed. So after 12 hours of feeding, if what energy is produced by your body is called the basal metabolic rate. And it can be described in terms of kilojoules or calories 40 calorie per kg per minute is the basal metabolic rate okay so that definition also sometimes will be asked because that is the main activity of your thyroid gland secretion or thyroxine <clears throat> okay uh, right okay sir. so you have to keep everything prepared to manage a thyroid crisis in case it happens so will you pass the rail tube uh, before induction or after induction you said you can give, 
the antithyroid drugs through the stomach by rail yes, tube sir. so would you like to place the rail tube before starting anesthesia or after starting anesthesia um, i would do it before uh, starting uh, uh, after intubating and before giving the patient uh, to the surgeon so patient and uh, so it is before the endotracheal intubation you should try to avoid the rail tube Isn't it placement of rail tube? If at all it is there, even some ga ga gastroenterology pr procedures you would have seen uh, previously in those days they used to pass the rail tube in the ward itself and send the patient with the rail tube fixed in the nose. But nowadays we don't encourage that. Why? What is the reason that? you should not keep the endotracheal tube in situ while you are inducing anesthesia and planning for endotracheal intubation uh it is already a difficult airway sir it can obscure the vision sir not like that sir i am tube going through the nasopharynx how will it in obscure your vision and that too it's a small size uh, tube okay so what will what will it do to the How many sphincters are there in the last class on gastroenterology? Basics of it relaxes the lower esophageal sphincter tone, sir. So that the risk of aspiration. Lower esophageal sphincter tone does not affect the low, low, lower esophageal sphincter. It's a smooth muscle sphincter, isn't it? It is not paralyzed or it is not relaxed by your muscle relaxant, which you give for your intubation. Whereas the upper esophageal sphincter, cricopharyngeus muscle, that is paralyzed. Okay, and through the paralyzed thing, if you put a rail tube, it keeps it open and allows the stomach contents to regurgitate, and the chances for aspiration is more. So, in all elective cases, it is preferable to intubate the first patient first tracheally and then pass the endotracheal i mean nasopharyngeal or rail tube after the intubation is successful okay so that you don't have the fear already you are giving a relaxant to open up the cricopharyngeus muscle and if the passage of rail tube is there it will guide the fluid to come into the pharynx because that forms like a channel so it kind of guides the fluid on the sides of the tube it will come and collect in the pharynx So it is better not to have the rail tube in situ until you successfully intubate the patient, and then <clears throat> uh, uh, we place the tube after that. So that is a point that you have to remember that while uh, doing a patient with uh, hyperthyroid, where you are uh, anticipating thyroid storm, it is always a must that you pass the. rail tube after intubation okay so these are the preparations that you have to think of keeping the anti thyroid drugs ready uh, keeping your uh, beta blockers like both prenorenal propranolol as well as esmolol ready <coughs> what steroids you would like to have dexamethasone dexamethasone you must have that will be available in the emergency drug cart itself you can get your lugol side in and also um, okay, keep it ready for uh, insulation through the rail tube and most important you must have cooling facilities available with the form of i cooled iv fluids cooled irrigation fluids for both the stomach and the bladder and surface cooling by cooling blankets as well as ice packs all these should be kept ready and should be available immediately as soon as you <coughs> notice any rise in etco2 happening intraoperatively what other important uh, instruction to be given to the surgeon if you think that the patient is going in for a thyroid crisis what instruction you will give the surgeon who is operating on the thyroid gland i'll ask minimal handling of the thyroid gland sir uh, first of all stop stop the stimulation and try start all your resuscitation methods and if the resuscitation methods are helpful and it is reducing the etco2 temperature everything then you allow the surgeon to do a quick job with a minimal handling of the gland otherwise you have to postpone the surgery recover the patient and take it up little later or in the second sitting or third sitting sometimes you may have to do it in different sittings also okay 
So that is what is the, the plan you have to keep in mind. Supposing it is a small gland, it is not a multinodular goiter, it is a small gland, but it is a gland with hyperactivity not responding to medical management. Is there any other way of uh, doing this surgery without general anesthesia? A unilateral yes, gland on the left side alone. No block. What nerve block you can give? Superficial whenever, uh, whenever you Tape save the block, you have to give the full name, not just uh, the word nerve block will not alone be sufficient. You can give superficial and deep cervical plexus block. Okay. Why do you require a deep cervical plexus block? Why not the superficial cervical plexus block alone? What is the supply? What is the root value and the supply of uh, superficial cervical plexus block? C3, C4, C5? Cervical 3, 4, and 5. These are the three branches which unite to form the superficial cervical plexus. And where does it emerge from? What is the technique of blocking the superficial cervical plexus? And shape the technique over the midpoint of sternocleidal mastoid muscle. Midpoint of medial border or lateral border? Or lateral border. See, always when the lateral block is asked in the examination, you must start from the four piece. As I have told you in the earlier classes, you have to describe it in four pieces. Piece. One is placement of the patient or position of the patient. Second is preparation, which area you have to prepare. Third is palpation of landmark. And fourth is puncture. These four pieces you have to remember. Position, preparation, palpation, and puncture. So for a superficial cervical plexus block, what will be the position of the patient? Supine position. Okay. Ah, patient supine. What about the head and neck? With the That's head the opposite, turn ah, off turn, to the opposite ah, side. Turn to the opposite side so that the sternocleidomastoid muscle becomes more prominent. So to okay. that extent, you must turn it. Not just gentle like, turning will not be sufficient. You have to turn it fully to make the sternocleidomastoid muscle taut and visible. So when you stretch that, you will be able to do that. That is the position. Then preparation is from the mastoid process and the ear on the upper side to the clavicle on the lower side and to the middle of the neck and the anterior aspect and posteriorly to the nape of the neck and back of the neck. So this is the area that you prepare and then drape and keep this area exposed. That is preparation. Now what are the palpatory findings you, palpation, what landmarks you want to find? Smooth ah, so you go and palpate the mastoid process above, trace the sternocleidal mastoid muscle downwards and see whether it ends in the sternum. Between the two heads, it will be forming and it will attach itself to the sternum. So make out the medial and lateral border. So what is the landmark or the anatomical thing that you will find to identify the landmark? Which vessel will cross there? External jugular. External jugular vein will be prominently crossing in most of the patients. You can easily see that. Okay. So more or less close to the external jugular vein will be the midpoint of the lateral border of the sternocleidomastoid. And that is the point where you are going to puncture and put your needle in. What is the depth you have to go? The needle insertion, how far it should go? What are all the structures? Just, just underneath the muscles, sir. Huh? Just underneath the muscles. Underneath the muscle, it's so deep. It's called superficial cervical plexus block. Above what the, are the layers under the skin? First thing you pierce is the skin at the midpoint, then subcutaneous tissue. 
then what is the special covering the neck has got superficial and deep cervical fascia yeah platysma and cervical fascia so that is the point you pierce the platysma but stop above the cervical fascia and that is the location where you have to inject if you go too deep you will be not hitting the nerve at all you will go be below the nerve it will be the, then the block will not be effective so the depth is very very important so you have to just pierce the skin the cutaneous tissue platysma and then the superficial fascia so in between the platysma and the cervical fascia is the location where you have to inject and raise the first wheel then what you have to do is put a long needle and uh, <clears throat> parallel to the lateral border of the sternocleida mastoid you inject about 5 to 7 ml in the point where you have raised the wheel you just inject about 2 to 3 ml then you go downwards along the same lateral border in the same plane and inject another 10 ml so you require totally about 20 to 25 ml of uh, local anesthetic whether it is 0.25 percent bupivacaine or 1 percent lignocaine whatever drug you choose you can use that for producing a <coughs> superficial cervical plexus block and that can be done but doing the surgery under a regional technique does it uh, prevent the occurrence of thyroid crisis no sir no but what is the advantage of doing it under a regional technique or a nerve block a plexus block Sir, we it can avoid intubation and dead response, sir. Very good. Okay. Arrhythmia, we can avoid, sir. Traumatic intubations. Polypharmacy, we can avoid, uh, sir. All that is the regular complications of the management of the airway. Early patient early. is conscious, isn't it? So he will early early. tell you that whether they get a little agitated, they're restless, all that can be easily found out more than depending on your etco2 and temperature and uh, uh, the heart rate you can the patient himself will say that uh, he can talk isn't it during the surgery if it is done under the plexus block patient can communicate with you and he can tell you that uh, something is amiss and he is not feeling happy what other alternative is there for cervical plexus block what other regional techniques have been described even though not practiced widely. Cervical epidural anesthesia. Cervical sir. epidural block. Very good. So, uh, have you anyone seen a cervical epidural block being done in your institutions? Sir, in Madre, not a very popular done. technique because many anesthetists are scared to do that. What is the other indication for a cervical epidural? Not with a local anesthetic, but with some other drug. cervical epidural block but not with a classical local anesthetic but what other drug can be injected in the epidural space and what is the indication epidural steroids cervical epidural steroids can be given for brachial plexus pain or you can give it for the disc problem cervical disc problems neuro neuropathic pain caused by the cervical disc problem protrusions are managed by pain physicians by cervical epidural steroid injection okay that is one of the <clears throat> very frequently practiced pain ma management in the, for chronic pain relief right so these are the some of the tidbit points that you have to remember okay somehow you have finished the surgery <clears throat> The, what are the post op complications you can anticipate after any thyroid surgery? Not only this surgery, any thyroid surgery, what are the common post op complications? Before extubation or after? Hematoma can be caused. Intraoperatively, what are the problems? Post operatively, what are the problems? Immediately, we can have tracheomalacia, sir. La, laryngeal uh, nerve uh, paralysis, palsies, sir. Mm. Laryngospasm, we can uh, 
First of all, interoperative problem. What are the very uh, threatening interoperative problems? Life threatening interoperative problem. Is mainly by ecosystem bleeding, sir. Ah, thyroid gland is has a very rich vascular supply. What is the blood supply of thyroid gland? Superior thyroid artery and the inferior thyroid artery, sir. Uh, branches of uh, superior thyroid artery is a branch from middle sir, uh, uh, carotid artery. Sir. Uh, inferior the breakage of the uh, So they are all high pressure arteries or low pressure arteries? High pressure arteries. Sir. High pressure arteries. So they can bleed like mad if it is not properly clamped. So uh, any novice surgeon or a uh, Surgeon with not a, so, a, such good hand can cause torrential bleeding intraoperatively. That is the only risk that uh, this, that is a mainly a surgical complication, not by us. But the complication not dependent on the surgeon or the anesthetist. But that can be life threatening. What is the next important complication apart from hemorrhage? Recurrent laryngeal nerve uh, injury. Current nerve nerve intraoperatively you may not be knowing it because your endotracheal tube is still there. So patient will be you will be able to identify that only after surge, after the exhibition. Before that, it is not possible unless you do a uh, intraoperative monitoring. You will not be able to know. Air embolism, can it happen if this patient yes, is not properly positioned and the major vein is open? There is all the chance of air embolism. That air embolism can be quite disastrous because all the neck veins are, sometimes you will have very, very bulging anterior thyroid veins or anterior cervical veins, which will be seen through the skin itself. So I have seen one case where the surgeon made an incision and the incision went right through the tortuous uh, dilated uh, anterior cervic uh, cervical vein and uh, luckily immediately the surgeon held it with his hand otherwise a uh, uh, lot of air can get entrained even though you have a little head up tilt to avoid that still air, entra air entrainment and air embolism can happen okay now this may lead to the question how do you manage intraoperative air embolism The field immediately with the saline. Very good. Uh, we have but to change the hundred percent of the Imagine that you are doing this thyroid surgery, and there is a, what are the features of air embolism? How do you diagnose air embolism? First of all, there is a cut in the vein, and surgeon fails to close it or hold it, as for my surgeon did it. Uh, the air has got entering. What will be the clinical picture of the patient? Sudden drop, drop in in sudden drop in ETCO2. Sudden drop in ETCO2. Patient also will have a drop in blood pressure and tachycardia will ensue because the blood is not getting pumped from the right side to the left side. Okay, So there is a decrease in cardiac output which is compensated by tachycardia. So there is a sudden drop in both blood pressure and ETCO2 with a rise in heart rate. How do you confirm the diagnosis? These are all clinical findings. Drop in blood pressure, tachycardia, and drop in ETCO2 are the clinical findings and the monetary findings. Any other method of identifying whether it is uh, air embolism or not? Can do valsalva and check for the vessel integrity. Valsalva intraoperatively. Mm -hmm. Auscultation for a middle ah, beam. You can ask the surgeon to drape, lift the drapes or don't worry about sterility and all that. You put your stethoscope on the chest and what type of murmur you will get? Millwheel murmur. Mill mill murmur. Because the whole air is getting churned with the blood, you get what is called the millwheel murmur will be there. Okay. So these are the four points that the examiner one expects from you. One is there is a sudden drop in blood pressure, compensatory tachycardia, drop in ETCO2, 
and by auscultation you can identify a mill wheel murmur if these four things are there it is a confirmatory evidence of very large volume to air entrainment causing air embolism okay so once the diagnosis is confirmed tell me step by step during thyroid surgery if this happened tell me step by step how to manage this sir 100% auto should be given sir at the uh, very good cut off all the anesthetic agents and give 100% oxygen and uh, we have to treat we have to take an avg and we have to treat if there is a metabolic acidosis sir we have to give uh, uh, hmm. esmolol or propanolol sir Uh, Already BP is low. Rate, one, 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 one second, one second. Go slow. Let me uh, interfere in your answering. Already the pulse rate is only gone up. BP is low. You want to give esmolol or propanolol in this situation? We are talking about management of air embolism, not thyroid crisis. Okay. Sir, okay. I would like to secure uh, central venous access, sir. Very good. At this situation. In this situation it is difficult so I... large amount of yes, air sir. has gone in and there yes, is uh, first the aim is to get the air out and establish the continuity of blood flow from the right side of the heart to the left side okay yes, so 100% oxygen is always the answer for any emergency situation that is the first answer as anesthesiologist expected from you so what he said is right and the cut off uh, any air or nitrous oxide or chlorine or isoflurane whatever reagent you are giving switch off all that and give 100% oxygen that is always the primary uh, first step in any emergency situation second thing what should you do is as somebody said plus the site of surgery with saline keep on pouring saline so that only saline gets in and train and ask the surgeon to press and close the vein also here you can see the open vein you can close that and prevent further air entrainment third thing is what is the position of the patient for thyroid surgery this is like extension with a little head up tilt 20 to 30 degree head up tilt to prevent the bleeding so that has to be reduced and patient has to be brought to trendelenburg position so that the air will come to the most superficial part and also turn the patient to one side as the surgeon to cover the wound with a sterile towel or a pad and turn the patient to right lateral or left lateral yes, left lateral what is that position called head down left lateral durance position. position durance position okay that is the answer that the examiner expects you so 100% oxygen cover the wound and plaster the wound with 100 uh, normal saline immediately bring down the head of the patient to good remember question turn the patient to left lateral so that the right side becomes uppermost so that all the air collects in the right atrium doesn't go down and that is called the durance position these are all the steps some some of you were yet to go for your uh, theory exam this is a common question asked in the theory also what is the uh, cause of what are the conditions where you can expect air embolism to happen and what is the method of management is one of the short note question frequently asked and uh, of course the final answer final pass step is to remove the entrain the air that can be done only by either puncturing the right atrium uh, with a long needle and removing the air otherwise as somebody said you can put in a pvc line and try to aspirate the air these are the methods by which you can salvage a patient who has had a air embolism happening so hemorrhage and the air embolism are the two intraoperative complications what are the post op complications you have to anticipate one is as you said the post op complications usually have with the airway concern okay so after the surgery when you reverse the patient and then extubate the patient that is the time you will start noticing whether the patient has got any airway problems so what are the airway problems that can happen after uh, extubation of the patient tracheal collapse due to tracheal malaria tracheal collapse is a very very rare thing unless you have a very large thyroid gland 
for a very number of years Sakyu Malaysia I have hardly seen only one case in my entire career so Sakyu Malaysia is a last option more commoner than that post excavation laryngospasm and laryngeal edema ah, common can be laryngospasm and laryngeal edema especially if the pain relief has not been good and the surgeon is very rough in handling the gland and his surgery is uh, not surgery but butchery then uh, can develop a uh, possibility of laryngeal edema and laryngeal spasm that is number 1 number 2 unidentified nerve injury surgeon should be very meticulous and very careful to demonstrate the presence of the nerve if the nerve is not identified properly and he has injured it intraoperatively then patient will have problems with the airway because of the tracheal uh, laryngeal recurrent laryngeal nerve injury okay and we have seen in one of the classes about uh, the ascii what are all the various forms of recurrent laryngeal nerve injury that can happen to the patient isn't it so can anyone uh, lokesh can you describe the various forms of recurrent laryngeal nerve injury yes sir Uh, first it is uh, it can be complete or incomplete sir and very it good. can be unilateral or bilateral sir bilateral very good so what are the various uh, things that happen when you do a examination of the vocal cords what will be the position and the placement of the vocal cords in these various forms of nerve injury uh, uh, most uh, dangerous one is the incomplete and bilateral where the both the vocal cords will be in the cadaveric positions uh, so there is be chances of uh, uh, complete obstruction of That's the cadaveric position if it is uh, complete uh, i mean incom- complete is it the is that the most dangerous or incomplete bilateral is most dangerous incomplete bilateral is no ah, dangerous why, why you are worried about incomplete bilateral because there will be complete adduction of both the cords and it will cause ah, air, airway obstruction sir it will be a total obstruction because the abductors are paralyzed and adductors are still acting so vocal cords will come into the midline and close tightly so reintubation also will be very very difficult whereas bilateral complete Palsy will be, as you said, cadaveric position. What is the advantage in cadaveric position? Does it come into the midline and close? It it lies no, sir, it it away go. from the midline. So there is a small opening present. So patient can breathe through that. But what is the risk involved in that? Aspiration. 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 He will not be able to protect his trachea and airway. So the risk of aspiration is there. If it is a partial unilateral injury what will be the feature uh, when we ask the patient to phone it then he will not be able to do it especially we will ask him to say e and he he will not be, he will not be able to achieve good uh, decibel volume of the volume. sound sir also he may have hoarseness when they try to hoarseness. talk the voice will be hoarse okay so hoarseness simple hoarseness will be there and that is not a major problem with airway management so patient will be still able to uh, uh, breathe normally and maintain its uh, saturations but only the voice will be hoarse and he will not be able to phone it as you said in a normal way otherwise all the uh, other problems are only going to cause more problem so this is the uh, second uh, Uh, first um, first common is simple edema second is na recurrent laryngeal nerve injury of various forms and the third is only the tracheal malacia which you have to suspect in a long standing huge goiter which has been harbored by the patient for quite a long time so is there any way to identify before you extubate whether the patient is likely to develop a tracheal malacia in a situation where the patient had a huge gland for a long number of years we can do leak test and uh, you can do cuff leak test you just don't say just leak test say cuff leak test okay so yes. how do you do the cuff leak test and how do you assess the severity of collapse
we have to replay the no. code completely. Yeah, you so, are. Couplet test can be done before extubation, sir. Uh, we have to we have to close the tube and we have to deflate the tube, sir. Uh, deflate deflate the cuff, sir. Uh, the absence of audible leak around the cuff uh, indicates there is a palsy, sir. If there is a audible uh, sound, then um, <coughs> There will be difference in the tidal volume delivery between the set and the delivered tidal volume, sir. So there are two methods of assessing or interpreting the cuff leak test. One is volume assessment. Second is audible sound assessment. This is the way you do the cuff leak test. So at the end of surgery, in a patient who has undergone a thyroid, total thyroidectomy for a very, very huge sized gland, which has been there for a long number of time, and you have suspect, you have a suspicion that the patient may develop a tracheobalacia. After you give the reversal and uh, uh, you are satisfied with all the recovery of the patient, before just deflating and pulling the tube out, you allow the patient to breathe spontaneously with the endotracheal tube after disconnecting the patient from the machine. You allow the patient to breathe spontaneously with the EC tube and completely deflate the cuff of the endotracheal tube. Normally, if there is no collapse, you will hear a quite a sizable sound which can be heard by all indicator without your stethoscope or anything. If you hear the normal leak sound coming from the patient, that means there is no tracheal collapse because the tube is now completely deflated. There is no tracheal collapse at all. The second situation is you are not able to hear any sound without any uh, uh, from the patient, but you put your stethoscope over the trachea and you find some noise of air moving, that means it is a moderate collapse. So some air is able to pass out, but it is not loud enough to be heard by everyone without the use of stethoscope. Then you make a diagnosis that it's a moderate collapse. The third thing is there is absolutely no sound when the patient is breathing either without stethoscope or with the stethoscope. That means the trachea has collapsed and it has also become like a cuff and close to the tube. So absolutely no sound at all heard. So if that is the case, which is an indication of a severe collapse. So no sound, sound heard only with stethoscope, sound heard even without stethoscope. These are the three types of responses you can see after deflation of the cuff in a patient breathing spontaneously. The second thing is you can Measure the exhaled volume. You can use a spirometer and then measure the exhaled volume. And depending upon the amount of air that is coming out, if there is uh, uh, no collapse at all, you will get the entire tidal. I mean, if there is a collapse which is uh, acting like a cuff, you will get the entire tidal volume coming out. Like 500 ml will be there. Uh, whereas if there is a partial collapse or no collapse, then the leakage will be about anything between 100 to 150 ml will leak through the sides and you will get a tidal volume of only 350 ml. Okay? So you can make out the volume also, which will be different in the patients with no collapse and patients who have a complete collapse. <clears throat> so if you get the entire tidal volume coming out, that means it is a total tracheomalacia compressing the core tube and all the air is coming only from the endotracheal tube, which is not passing through the sides. On the contrary, if there is a gap between the tube and the trachea, part of the gases will escape through that, and what you measure at the end of the endotracheal tube will be only two-thirds of the tidal volume. So these are the two methods by which you can identify the presence of tracheomalacia, and this is how the answer for cuff leak test to be written. So once the cuff leak test is positive, <clears throat> you don't hear any sound, either without a stethoscope or with a stethoscope, and the volume that is measured is also normal full tidal volume. What is your next step? 
will you extubate the patient or will you do some other maneuver? I will place an airway exchange catheter. Very good. Uh -huh. And uh, I will try trial. Do a trial extubation. Yes, sir. Uh, and mm. um, if if at all I face any uh, difficult airway scenario like strider, then I will use the airway exchange catheter to railroad the ED. With the just the airway exchanger, will you be able to reintroduce the tube? It will be difficult, sir. Very difficult. So what what else yes, you sir. can do? I will keep a uh, uh, before uh, if it is a difficult airway, I will keep a rigid bronchoscope available with me inside the OP, sir. Rigid uh, bronchoscope. Why do you want a rigid bronchoscope to pass it through that? No, sir. Uh, it helps in maintaining the patency of the trachea, sir. Uh, in uh, cases like collapse, uh, total airway collapse, sir. Okay. Uh, Anybody else has got any other suggestion? Lokesh okay, suggests it's the rigid bronchoscope. But I would like to differ from that. I would like to do something else. Can anyone tell me what other uh, options are there? Flexible bronchoscope, can you use? We can use, sir. Ah, that is a better option. What you can do is you can put in a flexible bronchoscope and go up to yes, the sir. carina, visualize the carina, yes. and then gradually bring it out along with the endotracheal tube. And if you see a sudden collapse of the trachea, then you yes, reintroduce the tube and then take out the flexible bronchoscope. Don't extubate. On the contrary, if the trachea is not so much collapsed, then you can safely re-extubate, come up to the vocal cord, watch for some time, and if the patient is comfortable, then you can extubate or push back the tube, whatever you want to do. But if it is going to be a very narrow collapse, then you better keep the tube in situ and ask the surgeon to get ready for a for a tracheal stenting procedure. Tracheostomy. So. Okay. So the surgeon mm -hmm. should do a tracheostomy on the table to prevent any further deterioration of the condition. So these are the three airway problems that you have to anticipate in the immediate post extubation phase. One is laryngeal edema or laryngeal spasm. Second is recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, the various forms. Third is tracheomalacia. Okay. Then after no such problem has happened on the table. After two hours or three hours, what, is, what type of airway problem can happen? There can be collection of uh, hematoma, subcutaneous hematoma, which can cause compression of compression. the airway. Okay. So that is the second stage or the later complication of the thyroid surgery is hematoma formation. So surgeon has failed to ligate all the bleeding vessels and slowly blood has collected and it is causing again a swelling, which is going to cause compression and patient go in for strider. So what are the methods of managing that? Again, as an anesthesiologist, you will be the first person to get a call because patient will be in the post anesthetic care unit, PACU. So all the calls will come only to the anesthetist. So what are the things that you will do? You see the patient in a distress, desaturating, having a strider. <clears throat> How will you manage that situation? Sir, uh, first I will get uh, try to get a control of the airway, sir. Uh, I will uh, try to uh, use uh, AMBO or veins and try to give oxygenate the patient. Mm -hmm. And I will immediately remove the dressing I will ask the bystander to remove the dressing, expose the dressing, and if I feel that uh, some hematoma collection is seen, I will ask them to uh, cut the sutures and release the compression. So uh, you, and, you don't do ask the bystander to do all that. First and foremost thing, you first see whether the patient is receiving any supplementary oxygen or not. Sometimes, you know, okay. if the hematoma happens about three, four hours, Initially, because patient was stable, the nurse would have removed the nasal oxygen from the patient. And patient may be breathing room air. So your first aim is always in this situation to restore higher oxygen FiO2. So 
so you give more oxygen either through the uh, ask for the high flow nasal oxygen or ask somebody to uh, mm -hmm. as you said bag mask assist the ventilation with higher percentage of oxygen and you better do the suture removal because we you don't know the duty doctor or houseman may not be competent enough to do that so remove all the dressing wear a sterile glove and cut off all the sutures and try to evacuate the uh, uh, hematoma and release the pressure so that the patient can become comfortable if all these maneuvers do not help then what will you do You have to intubate the patient and maintain the airway because it is a yes. mechanical compression caused by the hematoma. So you have to again reintubate the patient. So how will you reintubate a patient in the post anesthetic care unit after recovery from anesthesia? Patient is now conscious and struggling and is having a strider. So how will you yes, intubate the patient? How do you do the intubation in an ICU in an emergency? Mm -hmm. um, I would I would give a, a, a sleeping dose of benzodiazepines and I would go with uh, short acting uh, muscle relaxant mm -hmm. and uh, and then I will uh, uh, prepare myself with smaller size uh, ET tubes available for me uh, okay. for integration okay. and uh, uh, the all. okay yes sir. Right. Supposing this is your, this is what you do practically in the examination, I mean, the, in the ICU, whenever you are on duty. But what is the one point that is missing in your answer from examination point of view before you give the benzodiazepam and relax and, and then put your scope and write it? I will, yeah? I will adequately pre oxygenate the patient, sir. Before that, I will keep the tracheostomy set uh, available. More than I'll that. inform the surgeon. The patient had a bleeding, had a hematoma. You are, you are aim is to first release the pressure. So you have removed the sutures and they evacuated the hematoma. But have you noticed what is his pulse rate? What is his blood pressure? How hemodynamically he is stable? That point will be expected out of you from the examination. So you have to quickly assess the hemodynamic status of the patient. Supposing he has already had a very low blood pressure. Because of the bleeding, uh, the BP has dropped to 80 by 50 and he has a heart rate of 120. Okay, simultaneously, you should take measures to correct that hypovolemia and hypotension also. Otherwise, what will happen if you intubate a patient who is in a hypovolemic, hypoxic state? That itself can produce cardiac arrest. Okay, yes. so always try to answer, and this is practically also is important. You must simultaneously, because in ICU emergencies, it's always you must have a look at all the parameters, not only airway, you must look into the hemodynamic stability also and uh, try to rectify it as quickly as possible. You can give a shot of epidrine or phenylephrine or start a dopamine drip or an oral drip and then try to intubate the patient. Otherwise, you will have a, a sudden cardiac collapse and the patient may die. And you will be blamed. The doctor came and he tried to intubate, patient arrested because he did not take proper care. That will be the blame that we given to you. <clears throat> right? So that is the uh, method of managing the airway uh, in the immediate post-op period of say three to four hours. But can a patient develop a Airway problems after 24 hours to 48 hours? Yes, yes sir. We can uh, what is it due to? Hypocalcemia. Hypocalcemia Hypo produced by? Removal of the parathyroid. Inadvertent total removal of the parathyroid. Okay. Total parathyroidectomy. Removal of all, all the four parathyroid glands, which happens especially in which type of thyroid surgery? Total thyroid. Thyroidectomy. Okay. Partial thyroidectomy, you will have some part of the gland left. So parathyroid will escape. Even if you have one parathyroid gland, that is more than enough. But in total thyroidectomy, especially when it is done for malignancy, there is a lot of chance that patient will lose all the parathyroid glands and will go in for hypocalcemia. Calcium levels will become low. 
so how to identify and how to manage hypocalcemia so first uh, there are uh, clinical signs there are two clinical signs to identify so hypocalcemia what, what are they uh, they are uh, chostex sign and trousier sign sir that is objective method of establishing the uh, hypocalcemic state but what will yes, be sir. the patient's complaint he will have twitching of the facial muscles ah circumboral numbness twitching of facial muscles or carpopedic yes. spasm on on its own it can happen even without elevating your blood pressure cuff patient may kai kalla korakli vaangudhu that is what they will say may they have, i feel my cramp cramp like feeling in my hands and feet okay this will be the patient's complaint and sometimes they may have difficulty in breathing also the respiratory muscles also may become paralyzed or weaker so patient will say i find it difficult to breathe also okay and he will may have a stridor because the laryngeal muscles are also partially acting so he may have a stridor he may have carpopedal spasm he may have carpomoral tingling and numbness all these things are the patient's complaints and that can be objectively demonstrated by doing your tapping on the facial nerve or elevating the cuff of the okay. deep limb and the limb and then demonstrating carpopedal spasm okay right once uh, your diagnosis is confirmed how do you treat this sir uh, i i would prefer uh, giving uh, 10 m uh, 10% calcium gluconate intravenously so we have it will be given as, as a 10 ml of 10% calcium gluconate over 10 to 15 minutes slowly intravenously mm. uh, after that i will uh, put the patient on a basal infusion of calcium gluconate yeah mm. uh, uh, or i may okay normally when a patient undergoes total thyroidectomy what should be the regime anticipating the problem of hypocalcemia what is the method of treating a patient who has undergone total thyroidectomy where there is a possibility of total thyroidectomy also happen do they have to get calcium supplementation in the immediate post op or some other drug has to be given oral calcium can be supplemented before that any other drug vitamin d supplementation will be given okay these patients okay. will see what is called calcitrol they get the vitamin d supplementation right from day 1 after total thyroidectomy and later assessing the calcium values they will start getting calcium tablets 500 mg three times or four times a day depending upon the calcium value okay so if the patient demonstrates he has not been given vitamin d you have to give that also along with oral calcium after managing the acute episode of hypocalcemia with intravenous calcium gluconate okay so there are various regimes which are available for treating this hypocalcemia so these are the three important st stages where airway difficulty can happen one is in the immediate excubation period as i told you due to the three conditions then 3 4 hours later due to hematoma and compression and 24 to 48 hours later due to hypocalcemia because of removal of parathyroid glands in especially total thyroidectomy cases so these are the complications of thyroid which can happen which we have to be quite aware of now supposing the patient is not a hyperthyroid but patient is a hypothyroid patient yes sir what are the Uh, guidelines for managing patients with hypothyroidism supposing how do you first of all diagnose hypothyroidism what is primary hypothyroidism and what is secondary hypothyroidism sir uh, primary hypothyroidism the tsh level will be increased sir t3 t4 uh, level will be decreased sir in uh, secondary hypothyroidism uh, tsh t3 and t4 levels will be all the three levels will be decreased sir hmm. 
primary you said tsh is elevated yeah, elevated sir tsh is elevated okay very good right supposing patient has got elevated tsh sir we have to give t3 t4 are normal can what do you call that subclinical hypothyroidism subclinical hypothyroidism so there are three conditions subclinical hypothyroidism where t3 t4 values are normal but tsh is mildly elevated then there is a primary hypothyroidism where t3 t4 is low but tsh is elevated then there is a secondary hypothyroidism where all the three are decreased i mean all the three i mean t3 t4 tsh is also decreased all the three are decreased then it is a secondary hypothyroidism now what are the criteria or guidelines available for managing these different types of patients supposing the patient requires a incidental procedure for example a female patient with a primary hypothyroidism where t3 t4 are normal and she has a elevated tsh she comes for a dnc for a dysfunctional uterine bleeding will you accept the patient or not sir we have to check the tsh level sir uh, if it is uh, I, already uh, i told you the tsh is uh, ele elevated but t3 t4 are normal so your diagnosis is subclinical hypothyroidism in that situation isn't it yes sir so if that is the case is there any contraindication for giving anesthesia to this patient for a minor surgical procedure like dnc yes, since it is an uh, emergency procedure we, have, we will go ahead with the procedure sir okay. yes so there is no contraindication for anesthetizing a patient for any surgical procedure if they have only subclinical hypothyroidism which means their t3 t4 values are normal but there is a mild to moderate elevation of tsh on the contrary if the patient is a known primary hypothyroidism with t3 t4 also being very drastically low and tsh very much elevated to compensate for that in those patient it is ideal that they are made u thyroid by giving thyroxine supplementation correcting the situation and then taking off if the surgery is not an emergent one on the contrary if the surgery becomes emergent a known primary hypothyroid patient and has a trauma they have uh, had an injury and she requires a surgical intervention for trauma how will you manage that patient she has not taken any thyroid in supplementation but she has all the features of hypothyroidism what are the features of hypothyroidism clinically when you examine the patient how will they look like they will uh, they will be obese sir physically when you see okay uh, uh, all reflexes they will be little lethargic okay uh, the reflexes will be dull and uh, they might have mixomatous appearance uh, so mantus appearance hmm. they will have uh, cold intolerance sir they will have dry coarse skin sir skin you start from the skin when you look at a patient you are first seeing their external appearance so always start with the skin description it's a dry, dry coarse skin, skin, skin sir with sparse hairs especially yes. sometimes you know the very first complaint with which a patient will come to the doctor will be i have lot of hair fall i am becoming bald that will be the most common complaint with which a lady with hypothyroidism will come to the doctor and if you examine them they will have severe hypothyroidism t3 t4 will be low tsh will be raised then the other complaint they will come with is i am putting on weight i am not eating much i don't have much appetite but of uh, late i have gained 5 kilos 5 kilos in two months time this will be the common thing third thing is i always feel sleepy and lethargic i am not able to carry out my day to day routine and i get a scolding from my husband especially female patients will say that because he is saying i am lazy so these are all the things that to which they will come so if that is the case it is better to uh, treat them and correct the hypothyroid state but in an emergency what will you do 
patient has not gone to the doctor she has been suffering like this but they probably she was not aware that she is having this hypothyroid problem and they have developed a trauma how to manage that patient what are the complications you can anticipate in that patient so if you have to give anesthesia but we have to be prepared with uh, by uh, intraoperatively uh, patient can develop uh, uh, myxedema coma sir we have, to get, we have to address this issue preoperatively to the attendant and we must get appropriate consent for the same okay. and uh, uh, we have to uh, make available uh, iv t3 drug if it if at all it is available or we can go with uh, nasogastric uh, installation mm. of uh, levothyroxine medications mm. uh, we what have are to keep what, what uh, are the drugs you will try to avoid in these patients and what are all the physical preparations that you can do in the ot are they prone to or very they have cold intolerance yes sir they are very yes, sensitive sir. to opi ah. so what type of opioid sensitivity they exhibit when a patient is sensitive or very very highly responsive to opioid what type of uh, uh, clinical present respiratory depression sir they can develop respiratory depression Retro, uh, respiratory rate will go down when the respiratory go yes, rate goes down what will happen what will happen to the gases in the body Will they develop hypoxia or hypercarbia? Hypercarbia. 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 So these patients will they respond to the hypercarbic stimulus? No, sir. No. Oh, so that is no, the sir. biggest danger. That is what is the opioid sensitivity in these patients. They develop respiratory depression. Go for bradypnea. Their respiratory rate goes down, but the CO2 accumulation that will happen because of the low respiratory rate will not stimulate their respiratory center like a normal person, and they will not be able to clear the CO2 accumulation, yes. and they will die only of CO2 narcosis. That CO2 will be gradually building up, and because they can't increase their respiratory rate to wash out, so they will die of CO2 narcosis. Narcosis. So the usage of opiate should be. very okay. very very carefully done that is number 1 the second important problem is the temperature what will happen to their core temperature or surface temperature sir already their core temperature is reduced so using of on the warm blankets is advisable sir so they are sensitive to cold so that will produce uh, hypothermia in these patients and because of the hypothermia the recovery will be delayed especially after ga the recovery will be delayed because these patients are still hypothermic so you keep the ambient temperature which is higher for these patients keep all the warming devices opposite to thyroid storm here you have to give only warm iv fluid keep the patient warm by covering warming blanket and keep the ambient temperature low and try to monitor the temperature and keep it around normal level of 37 degrees centigrade so that hypothermia does not cause cerebral depression and delay the recovery in this patient wherever possible use regional techniques so that you don't interfere with the central nervous system of these patients and if a possible you can give <coughs> as you said rightly thyroxine supplementation through the iv or a nasogastric group and try to correct it even though it may not get corrected immediately but at least it will help in restoring the required amount of thyroxine for the metabolism okay so these are all the points that are expected out of you in the examination what is uh, <clears throat> the uh, supposing elderly patient comes with only complaints of uh, palpitation and you take an ecg and it shows an atrial fibrillation what is it called he does not have any other <laughs> features of hyper or hypo uh, uh, thyroidism like uh, uh, increased uh, intolerance to cold or heat loss of weight or gain of weight 
none of the other features are there but only atrial fibrillation is present and the patient is an elderly patient what is the condition called we think it over and another yes, important uh, <clears throat> i'll keep it as a homework you just uh, search in your this thing and then let me know in the next class we will uh, quickly see your knowledge on the embryology of thyroid gland what are the how is thyroid gland where it does it uh, originate in the fetus and uh, how does it come to the neck does it uh, straight away start growing in the neck only or does it uh, originate elsewhere and then come to the neck can you describe the embryology of thyroid gland or developmental embryology of thyroid gland sir it develops from the floor of the primitive pharynx during the third week of gestation mm. sir very good uh, it it migrates along the thyroglossal duct to reach its mm. final location in the neck sir mm. uh, so so here the hormone synthesis also takes at 11 weeks of gestation sir okay mm -hmm. starts by uh, it it develops from the neural crest cell sir ultimo brachial body sir mm -hmm. so what is the condition called if the intrauterine production of uh, thyroid hormones are low what will happen to the baby when it is born if intrauterine thyroid synthesis is not adequate sir, goitrous goitrous enlargement of the thyroid will be there sir will to the uh, fetus sir ah it is a very severe uh, under production of thyroxine what is that child will be born as is there any particular name for that starting with the c and ending with n where in the infancy itself the thyroxine levels are low it's called cretinism or cretin ah, cretins it is called cretin okay so intra uterine low thyroxine produces a cretinism so patient is born with all the features of hypothyroidism and uh, the uh, neural and the uh, brain development is also affected in these patients Uh, that is about the embryology and the kind of next common question is why thyroid moves with deglutition why does the thyroid gland move with deglutition what is the anatomical reason for the movement of thyroid gland when the patient swallows sir it, it attaches to the suspensory ligament of berry and the pretracheal fascia sir okay it is enclosed in the pretracheal fascia and the fascia consolidates from the ligament that's called the berry's ligament and it berry's. is attached to which particular cartilage cricoid cartilage cricoid and hyoid cartilage so cricoid. that is how the whole movement takes place okay so these are all the points that we have to remember So I will just show you a quick presentation on that. Many of you, I don't know whether you have seen it in the YouTube, because this is a whole preparation that I have made. So in the, I will not take too much time to explain everything. So anatomy and embryology of thyroid gland is very important. Questions can be asked on that. And physiology of thyroid hormones, their formation, how the iodine um, uptake done, all these uh, points you have to know. and what are all the features of hyper or hypothyroid states and uh, pharmacology of anti thyroid drugs and thyroxine uh, even for hypothyroidism the pharmacology you should know and what are all the indications for thyroid surgery how do you evaluate a patient before surgery for thyroid surgery and what are the intraoperative management and problems and post op problems and management and how to manage uncontrolled hyperthyroid or hypothyroid patient so these are the points that will be commonly asked in the examination now sometimes they may ask you why it is called thyroid the answer is it is the word for uh, to mean shield that is the, the etymology comes from the greek word 
and uh, the Greek word it means it's a shield which is uh, used by the Roman warriors and uh, fighters and uh, this is the way the gland develops that is developing from the as we said third week of gestation there is a thickening in the floor between the first and second pharyngeal pouches in the fourth week the endoderm invaginates ventrally into the mesoderm to form the thyroid diverticulum and the fifth week the thyroidal duct is formed then it bifurcates the tip of the thyroglossal duct from our isthmus and lateral rope and then from fifth week onwards it starts growing down along the neck and migrates to the region where thyroid gland is present and from seventh at the seventh week itself it reaches its final position so the journey starts at third week of gestation and the ends at the seventh week by which it has come to the thyroid position in the front of the second third and fourth cervical ring so the thyroid gland development sometimes it can be <clears throat> improper that the place where it starts at the base of the tongue is called the foramen cecum which connects the thyroglossal duct with the pharynx and then there may be development of a pyramidal lobe in the thyroid gland in the distal part and if the travel from the pharyngeal pouches to the neck if it gets arrested anywhere in the midline then it can be in the lingual suprahyoid or retrohyoid or infrahyoid position and the thyroid gland is relatively large in newborn babies because it's a very important uh, hormone the thyroxine produced by the thyroid gland is a very important hormone for the brain and neural development of the babies so it is uh, overacting so newborn babies should normally have a little extra size of the thyroid gland sorry so the developmental route this is how the whole thing takes the anomaly it can be the foramen cecum or it can be suprahyoid hyoid level or infrahyoid and this is a normal position and uh, the situation it is actually present in the isthmus is present in the second third fourth ring and each lobe uh, starts from the middle of the thyroid cartilage and goes to the tracheal rings okay so this is the whole <coughs> gland present here starts from the middle of the thyroid cartilage then goes to the second third and fourth and in the lateral view if you see it is from c5 c6 c7 c1 just like your brachial plexus root it also extends to the same level and uh, the ligaments the suspensory ligament of the reed is nothing but a condensation of the connective tissue which binds the gland firmly to cricoid cartilage and upper tracheal ring and pretracheal fascia is a deep fascia which invests or splits and encloses and the ligament of bravery and the pretracheal fascia are responsible for the movement of the gland with deglutition okay that is the mechanism which is commonly asked in the examination arterial supply you get the superior thyroid artery from external carotid artery so it branches from external carotid to superior thyroid and inferior thyroid artery can arise from thyro cervical trunk or uh, other branches as uh, ascending cervical transverse cervical these are all the other branches of cervical uh, thyro cervical trunk so because they are straight from the high pressure vessels any mistake in ligation can lead to severe bleeding and rarely there may be a third artery called thyroid ema which also comes directly from the arch of the aorta so this is a anomalous artery so surgeon if they are, they are doing total thyroid assessment they have to specifically look for this and ligate this also so three arterial supplies then venous drainage along the superior thyroid middle thyroid and the inferior thyroid veins which all drain into the neighboring ivc <coughs> so that is the venous drainage and uh, there are triangles to identify especially because the recurrent laryngeal nerve is in always a danger of uh, getting uh, uh, injured or uh, damaged so the whole triangle where the nerve goes is called the riddle triangle but uh, some people have divided this riddle triangle into 
triangle of concern, Simon's triangle, and Bayer triangle. So the whole uh, little triangle is also divided into individually these triangles. And uh, this is the location where the uh, nerve tra traverses, that is between the common carotid on one side and then the thyroid, inferior thyroid on the other side and the nerve forming the mm. uh, third uh, uh, form of the triangle, which runs in the tracheoesophageal group. So that is the picture. And this is the physiology of uh, thyroxine formation. So blood carries the iodine and it is uh, entering the follicular cells through what is called the sodium iodine supporter. That is the passage with which it comes. And the iodine faint away goes into the uh, colloid uh, canal, the well in the middle through the pendrin passage. So the basolateral membrane, it enters through the sodium iodine mixing porter, and from there it goes through the luminal membrane to the pendrin ring, and then all the coupling takes place. And the uh, conjugation with tyrosine produces monodietri and all those things. And once the uh, T3 and T4 are formed, they are uh, taken back into the follicular cells and then kept in these vesicles. And when the stimulus comes and the need for the uh, release of thyroxine happens, this uh, vesicle is proteolized. The covering is removed and then you can see the T3, T4 are released through these channels called the MCT channel. And the thyroglobulin, which is respond, which is needed for the formation of thyroxine, is released or uh, produced by the nucleus, the endoplasmic reticulum of the follicular cells. And so these are all the amounts that is uh, produced. And you have this uh, iodine rings, iodine situated in the ring in various positions. That is why it is called the tri and tri tetrahydrothyroxine. Uh, and it is a feedback of the hormone which controls the release. And uh, the third thyroid, uh, thyroid function test refers to the following. You have to commonly test for the TSH level, 3, 3, 4, and 3, 3 levels, which are the, these values though given in the books uh, can vary from lab to lab. So it is better always to refer to the reference value given according to the lab. But normally, these are the values, picomole and nanomoles for T4 and T3, and micro units for TSH. These are the units by which it is called. And uh, there are separate range for children and pregnant women. The value is not uniformly common for all people. And so it may vary between labs also to refer your local guidelines. And the interpretation, how do you interpret? First, look at the value of TSH. If it is uh, normal, then look at the value of uh, T4. And if the T4 is also normal, patient is a uterine patient. On the contrary, if the T4 is raised, then it may be hyperthyroidism. If the T4 is low, it may be hypothyroidism. If the TSH is, is increased, that means it may be T4, if it is normal, it is subclinical. If the T4 is uh, raised, it is secondary. If it is decreased, it is primary. So raised TSH, low T4, primary hyperthyroidism. On the contrary, raised T4, raised TSH, it is secondary hyperthyroidism. And the third condition is increase, uh, decreased uh, um, TSH. And this is the T4, and that is how you correct the differentiate between these conditions. And the structure, if you understand, you can understand the difference between the normal T3 and the reverse T3. Mm -hmm. You have to know what is a reverse T3. So it has got two benzene rings attached, and the iodine is attached to the uh, positions here. So this is the third position for the uh, first ring. This is the third and fifth position for the second ring. So 
three five three five. This is the normal structure of levothyroxine. When it is uh, broken down and made to form T three, which is the active form, then one iodine is removed from the outer benzene ring. So it will have two iodines attached to the inner ring, which is three and five, and only one iodine attached to the outer ring in the third position. So it is called three five. Three prime. If you put on something like an apostrophe, it is called three prime, three five three prime triiodothyronine. This is the active form or a normal T3. On the contrary, if uh, instead of removing the iodine from the uh, 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 outer ring, if you remove it from the inner ring, the outer ring will have two uh, iodines attached in the Uh, three prime and five five prime positions, and only one iodine in the inner ring, which is a normal three. So three three prime five prime, it is called reverse T three. And reverse T three is not an active form; it is an inactive form. So the metabolism, how it is happening, how much is secreted, which is the active form, which is the free hormone. All these things are given here, and how the conversion takes place, and the T3 is uh, inactive, and that is what is happening in patients who are called sick thyroid patients who have a normal thyroid uh, values, but they don't uh, all show features of uh, hypothyroidism. Those patients are called sick thyroid patients, and. Uh, <coughs> What is the mechanism of action of TSH? How does it uh, help in releasing this? It has got a receptor at the uh, cell membrane of the follicular cell, and once it comes and attaches, it is something like a, a seven-pass membrane or a, a, a so-called serpentine receptor-like things, which uh, breaks down the <coughs> D protein that is attached to stimulate the adrenal cyclase, increase the cyclic AMP, and stimulate protein kinase, and that is the mechanism by which it uh, releases the thyroid gland. And uh, uh, so the way it is uh, transported, what we saw in the earlier one, which uh, the pictorial description is given in the form of uh, verses here. So. The initial steps of thyroid hormone synthesis are iodine has to be taken in <clears throat> through the sodium iodine supporter and then enter the colloid space. And then here all the attachments are done. And then the thyroglobulin is produced by the gene from the nucleus, endoplasmic reticulum. And then uh, that is also thrown into the colloid space. And then all the conversion takes place and then again stored. The picture what we saw is enough for that. So the active form is only T3, even though T4 is produced in large quantities, almost 80 percent, 75 percent. So 80 percent is T4, only 15 percent to 20 percent is T3. But uh, the T4 has to be converted into T3, and uh, the mechanism of action of thyroxine hormone. Sometimes the examiners may ask you about this. It. it helps in uh, growth. Increase in uh, growth hormone transcription is caused by increase in uh, level of the normal level of thyroxine, and in induction of anabolic anabolic enzymes takes place. So that helps in the growth of the person. Second, the impo important important function is temperature homeostasis. It helps in the normal temperature maintenance. Then oxygen consumption and beta basal metabolic rate. And it also increases the beta adrenergic receptor. This action is what I told you about the comparison between the catecholamines and the thyroid uh, hormone is because of the common factor of thyroxine being there in that. So it is a nuclear receptor acting drug, a hormone. So it just <coughs> enters the body and then goes and acts on the nucleus to produce the messenger RNA and the Final uh, gene transcription <clears throat> and produce all these changes in the uh, cell and causes all these effects. 
and uh, the functions are it increases the general metabolism is dependent on that and also many enzymes are produced by the activity of thyroxine hormone and uh, the number of mitochondria and their activity is also controlled by because uh, the main action is to produce enough energy for our survival and growth and development and respiration are also taken care cardiovascular activity because of beta adrenergic uh, activity it also increases the heart rate and also increases the sensitivity to catecholamine and uh, increases the blood flow to the skin to heat elimination and the cardiac output is increased and this is the reason why we give thyroxine for the uh, har uh, organ harvesting in a, a bra brain dead donor one of the reasons why we give uh, thyroxine is their thyroxine level will be low and uh, if you harvest the organ in that condition that will not function properly so to maintain the cardiovascular stability as well as organ uh, functioning graft function we always give this drug for the Uh, brain dead donor and in the ga tract it uh, increases the secretion of digestive juices hepatic conversion of carotene vitamin a and it is reproductively it is important for normal menstrual cycle and fertility that is why if the mother or a lady is hypothyroid unless you correct it they may not uh, have normal cycles and fertility may not occur and also it increases milk secretion in lactating woman so for that also thyroxine is very important and nervous system promotes growth and development right from the fetal life to the first few years and essential for normal myelination of the nerves and development of nervous system in infant increase the response to brain to catecholamine increases activation of reticular activating system <clears throat> and it works in carbohydrate metabolism food fatin all the metabolisms are there now coming to the question of what is a basal metabolic rate this amount of energy liberated by breakdown of food per unit time under standard condition what are the standard condition patient should be mentally and physically relaxed at comfortable temperature 12 hours after meal and the bmr corrected for age sex and body surface area so these three parameters have to be taken into consideration and it is determined by the heat produced we can measure the temperature change or the heat produced by the subject or oxygen consumption and the normal value is 197 kJ per square meter per hour or 40 calories per square meter per hour this is the uh, normal value so what happens in hyper and hypo all these things all of you are aware of and the, how the biochemical findings change in this is known that thyrotoxicosis is a hypermetabolic condition caused by elevation of thyroid hormones and it causes the beta adrenergic receptor upregulation and sensitization to catecholamines and the conditions which are responsible for this is grave disease which is a primary hyperthyroidism toxic multinodal nerve goiter toxic adenoma or hyperthyroidism causes like excess uh, thyroid administration and uh, symptoms are caused by excessive beta adrenergic activity including agitation tremor weight loss and patient with thyrotoxicosis uh, when they present for surgery it should be biochemically clinically uterized before surgery to avoid the risk of perioperative thyroid storm and the risk of trauma increases following acute events such as surgery trauma or infection so even without surgical intervention a simple infection can precipitate a thyroid crisis and what is apathetic thyroid toxicosis is the cardinal features are apathy and depression in contrast to the excitability and hyperkinesis of hyperthyroidism so it may not be always a real presentation of agitation anxiety maybe uh, directly opposite uh, patient may look depressed and dull and uh, that also but biochemically if you check the values you will have to all features of hyperthyroidism so can anyone uh, <clears throat> say what this picture shows something being directed to the neck Any guess? Anybody can guess what is that picture showing? 
it is a radiation treatment for thyroid malignancy okay so that is nothing but a radiation uh, applied to the thyroid and uh, the <laughs> these are the triggers for uh, uh, hyper uh, thyrotoxic crisis and this is what is happening in anesthetized patient and awake patient what are all the things that you have to use and the scoring system you use are but what so what top t and akamizus very difficult to pronounce and remember also so these are all the criteria that are taken for the uh, calculation so this is the uh, birth birth of t point scale where you have thermoregulatory function cardiovascular function gi tract central nervous system precipitating event all these things are taken into that and this is the akamizu diagnostic criteria where you take into the same things uh, cns fever tachycardia congestive heart failure and gi tract this does not have the precipitating event so only five criteria here whereas the previous one has got more criteria than that and uh, Uh, based on that you can assess the severity of thyrotoxicosis okay and uh, the diagnosis of central hypothyroidism often suspected in patients with hypothalamic or pituitary pathology in the setting of low normal or even slightly elevated serum tsh and low free thyroxin and the assessment of serum sti that is free thyroxin index may be helpful in diagnosis only for central hypothyroidism and free thyroxin index is calculated by total t4 divided by the tdi value thyroid binding agent value t uptake ratio and uh, these are the various measurements that are done and how you interpret the those uh, results all that has been already shown in another picture and uh, the types of malignancies sometimes uh, exam you may be uh, asked to examine a patient with a thyroid malignancy so normally the malignant thyroid glands are very hard in consistency and irregular and nodular and there are four types of malignant cells in this papillary follicular medullary and anaplastic carcinoma and papillary is supposed to be the most safest if at all one gets that 90% uh, 20 year survival post treatment and follicular also has a good prognosis and uh, whereas the medullary and aplastic have poor prognosis they are more virulent and more uh, troublesome um, malignancies and uh, if it is a solitary nodule 50% of them are benign occasionally thyroid nodules can be Uh, take on characteristic of malignancy and may require a biopsy before excision and the anti thyroid drugs and their pharmacology is another one which you have to know so inhibitors of hormone synthesis are these three drugs carbamazole metronidazole and propyl thiazol these two are same group but only thing it one is a pro drug another is an active form and the inhibitory hormone they release iodine sodium iodide organic iodide and radioactive iodine is given for ablation of the gland and the ionic inhibitors are thiocyanate and perchlorate and nitrate and this is the difference between the older propyl thiazol which is not used nowadays because of all the problems that it used to produce it especially causes uh, complete uh, destruction of all the cells in the blood so uh, is not used uh, commonly and carbamazole is the most uh, prevalently used drug added salts and iodine are also used for uh, suppressing the uh, iodine and thyroxine production in lugol solution is 5% iodine and 10% potassium iodide 5 to 10 drops per day uh, is the dosage and the added salts can be given in dose of 100 to 300 mg per day and uh, iodinated contrast media is called ipodate it uh, nicely suppresses the conversion of t4 to t3 by acting on this enzyme pi prime deiodinase in the liver kidney and peripheral tissue it is very useful in rapidly reducing t3 levels in thyroid crisis so apart from all the other drugs this drug has a very good scope of uh, treatment of uh, 
a thyroid crisis this drug is called ipodate idenated contrast media and uh, this is will take off turns thyroid off that's what we described with regard to lugalcidin and uh, radioactive iodine administered as a sodium salt of i131 dissolved in water and taken orally this is the method it emits x ray as well as beta particles is concentrated by thyroid incorporated in colloid emits radiation from within the follicle in beta particles penetrate around 0.5 to 2 mm of tissue thyroid follicular cells are affected with undergo spike diagnosis and necrosis for, followed by fibrosis with a large dose is given so this is mainly to destroy the gland itself and it's more commonly used in hyperthyroidism due to graves disease or toxic nodular gutter average therapeutic dose is 3 to 6 millicuri units and response is slow it starts after 2 weeks and gradually increases to peak at 3 months and beta blockers propranolol is used because it also helps in the uh, blocking the peripheral conversion of t4 to t3 so other uh, cardio selective agents that like esmolol or uh, metoprolol labetalol all these things will only reduce the heart rate but uh, propranolol is the drug which has this additional uh, uh, benefit of preventing the conversion of t4 to t3 and beta blockers are used in hyperthyroidism for situations while awaiting response for propyl thyroxine and carbamazole or along with iodine for preparation before subtotal thyroidectomy or it can be used in thyroid crisis also and in crisis you can give 1 to 2 mg iv slowly followed by 40 to 80 mg oral every 4 to 6 hours and uh, biological functions are when you that is in hypothyroid patients when you give thyroxine supplementation its uh, biological functions are helpful especially in children for normal human growth and development in pns in adults it maintains metabolic homeostasis affecting all organs and uh, it is a replacement therapy in deficiency state and you have the levothyroxine which is commonly prescribed available as the 150 25 microgram tablet and they should be taken uh, by oral route in the empty stomach in the morning so that is the way it has to get the maximum absorption so it is not to be taken after a meal or anything first thing in the morning that is why patients who come for surgery who are on eltroxin or thyroxin replacement you must give the tablet with sips of water so that uh, they don't develop any complication intraoperatively now what are the indications for thyroid surgery it can be for malignancy whether it is proven or suspected or patients developing obstruction because of the large gland or it may be a retrosternal extension without obstructive symptoms or it can produce hyperthyroidism unresponsive to medical therapy that is the case scenario that we had and recurrent hyperthyroidism or cosmetic or anxiety related or hashimotos uh, disease which normally produces hypoactivity and hypothyroid gutter with superimposed lymphoma are all the indications for surgery now pre op evaluation so you require these uh, <coughs> equipments like stethoscope glass of water tandem hammer and piece of paper and uh, a stethoscope to auscultate for bruy glass of water to demonstrate the movement with deglutition knee hammer or tendon hammer to see the excitability and the increased stretch reflexes and piece of paper to assess the tremor in patients where the tremor is not very obviously seen you can ask the patient to outstretch the hand and put the paper over that it will tremble very mildly so very mild tremors can be detected using this and you must do both the anterior lateral and posterior approach so the hands are inspected for tremor and pulse should be examined for tachycardia bradycardia in hypothyroidism or irregularity in thyrotoxic process or hypothyroidism <clears throat> and of course the hands can be dry in hypothyroid increased sweating in hyper 
and uh, thyroid acropathy, phalangeal bone crowding in Graves' disease, and palmar erythema uh, in hyperthyroidism. And uh, this is the uh, mixed edema, the pre tibial mixed edema in these patients, as well as the various signs. Some examiners are very fond of asking all the eye signs of uh, uh, hyperthyroidism. So, Stelbach sign, Joffrey sign, Moby sign, and Van Graaff sign, all these things you have to go and read before exam. And this is how the uh, insinuation test to find out the deviation or extension. And this is the last picture is the examination from back. You see, ask the patient to swallow and assess symmetry of the thyroid lobe elevation. So, this is to assess the symmetry. That is why you do it from the behind. And uh, this is the swallowing test. And this is the movement with the uh, tongue protrusion to discriminate or distinguish between thyroglossal cyst and the thyroid gland. And this is the percussion to find out the retrosternal extension. And this is auscultation to find the bruise. So these pictures will help you to remember the steps by which you must do. In case examiner is standing by you and asking you to examine, this is the way you proceed. The investigation you do should be a blood test for X-ray, ultrasound, FNAC, and uh, serum calcium is very, very important. You must assess the calcium level because post-op hypocalcemia can be uh, and then only confirmed that it is due to surgery and not due to the presence of hypocalcemia present to preoperatively itself. And uh, evaluation of thyroid diseases, of course, we have done that again. So this is the picture to show the compression and deviation of tactile air shadow. You can see the air shadow is uh, compressed here and also pushed to one side. And uh, this is the widening of the upper mediastinum because of the retrosternal goiter. Okay. So this is the picture to show that. The majority of the thing, we prefer uh, GA with the ED tube. Position of the patient will be supine with neck extension, eye protection and uh, <clears throat> Uh, it's very important, otherwise, you can cause uh, corneal alteration. IV lace, placement of IV line, whether it, uh, you are going to place it in the upper limb, better to have an extension to have a good access. Otherwise, you can start it in the foot or the ankle for easy access. And monitor location, ideally, <coughs> monitor is kept on the foot end of the uh, operating table. And pressure points have to be protected. And choice of VD tube between um, flexometallic and uh, other tube, which you see now, and controlled versus spontaneous respiration. Majority of the time, we do only control ventilation. So, this is the armor tube. And this is the nerve pole or nasal ray tube, which you can use orally also in this case. This is the only indication. And this is the Electromyographic tube mounted on the trackway, which is used for intraoperative uh, recurrent nerve testing to find out whether the nerve is in continuity and integrity is maintained or not. This is the position of patient for thyroid surgery. This is how you take care of the tube as well as the circuit which is attached within the tube. And you can see the uh, ECG leads are placed on the limb and the lower part of the body, keeping the area below the neck very free. So don't put them on the chest. And uh, these are the headdress that are used. And uh, the method of uh, attenuating the hemodynamic res response to coughing and staining during extubation, you can extubate the patient deep in uncomplicated airways. Uh, or you can use what is called the Bailey maneuver, where you can uh, completely deflate a pharyngeal mask airway and then introduce it behind the endotracheal tube and then inflate it and uh, remo remove the endotracheal tube and allow the patient to uh, maintain the respiration with the LMA so that the coughing and bucking during recovery will not be there. And uh, laryngotracheal anesthesia with the topical local can be maintained. 
and you can use it in the easy tube cuff itself for short surgeries you can put it in the cuff so that it will <coughs> seep out through that and maintain the anesthetizing uh, anesthesia and the mucosa of the trachea and you can administer dexmedetomidine before extubation so that the patient tolerance and uh, coughing will be very um, coughing will be reduced and patient will be able to tolerate the tube or you can use remifentanil which has now come into the market and for regional technique this is the method of superficial cervical plexus block and you can see the position and the markings that are given there and uh, this is the uh, cervical epidural which is given for uh, regional technique complications thyroid crisis we saw all that hemorrhage and uh, air embolism sometimes if it's a retrosternal you may need a sternotomy so you have to know whether it is going to be a retrosternal extension pre operatively and the in your method some surgeons want to monitor the recurrent laryngeal nerve so you have to go for only tiva or tca you cannot use a relaxant or a inhalation agent in those cases so the mode of anesthesia will be usage of tiva or tca and this is the current method robotic surgery and uh, endoscopic thyroidectomy as with uh, pick up picking up more in my uh, major corporate hospitals so there are several approaches so patient can um, be uh, introduced ports are introduced and you can see uh, three ports ultrasonic scope laparoscope and grasper and this is the gland is there so this is the axillary approach so uh, they introduce the scope through the axillary and there is also a transoral approach so they are putting it through the lower jaw and the uh, lips are elevated and so these are the three approaches for robotic thyroidectomy the airway complications as i told immediately recurrent injury laryngeal edema or tracheal malacia intermediate duration hematoma late duration hypocalcemia and the various positions of the uh, vocal cords in various types of uh, injuries and this is the endoscopic view of uh, normal and tracheal malacia patient so if you use a flexible fiber optic scope into the tube and then start withdrawing if you find this normal circumference that means it is a safe uh, non tracheal malacia trachea so you can safely extubate on the contrary this is the collapsing trachea so in that situation don't remove the tube push it back and keep this and the cup test is one by auscultation method another is a cup volume so there is no leak means no sound heard by auscultation and uh, mild means leak heard with the stethoscope significant means sound leak heard without stethoscope so if the sound is heard well even without stethoscope that means there is a good gap between the tube and the trachea but uh, this condition after deflation there is no sound heard at all that is the condition which indicates that there may be a trachea so these are all the modern things which are given uh, guidelines on post thyroid surgery uh, post operative observation to closely monitor the patient for what is called dsatch difficulty in swallowing discomfort and uh, ews that is early warning signs and new early warning signs swelling anxiety and tachypnea or difficulty in breathing spider these are all the things if you review and find out give oxygen head up uh, tilt and uh, evaluate arrange for immediate senior surgical review and uh, signs or airway compromise is there evacuate hematoma and request immediate senior anesthetic review and the management of suspected hematoma is flow chart oxygenate evaluate assess the dsat and their signs of compromise call for help evacuate hematoma and uh, clinical improvement patient is there yes then stop and think about oxygenation if not go for intubation so these are all the things that have to be done and uh, this is the parathermal hormone measurement and level so this is how the calcium supplementation guideline is given so uh, assess the corrected calcium level if it is more than 
with or with the symptoms are present continue with the regimen normally given if it is 7 to 7.9 patient can be asymptomatic mild symptomatic severe symptomatic but less than 7 is considered as a very serious condition so in that case give calcium gluconate 2 grams iv start uh, calcitrol which is uh, uh, vitamin d per oral twice a day increase frequency of uh, per oral calcium tablet to four times a day replace magnesium also if low so apart from assessing the calcium if it is not getting corrected maybe because of hypomagnesemia also so along with calcium you have to check for the magnesium level and the recommendations for post thyroid surgery emergency should include <coughs> artery club management of suspected hematoma scoop guideline as calcul fissure sterile gloves and all things so this is the scoop guideline for management of acute hematoma skin exposure cut suture open skin open muscles and fatty wounds so that completes the presentation on thyroid